So good evening, everyone. Um, Social Alliance and Green Left would like to welcome everyone here to this forum on the rise of the global far right. My name is Mary Merkinich. I'm a member of Socialist Alliance and I will be chairing this discussion tonight. We are meeting on the land of the Wurundjeri of the Kulin Nation. Their land was never ceded, it was taken by force. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, as socialists, it's not enough for us to simply acknowledge that we are on stolen land. We commit ourselves to supporting and building their campaigns that address the many harms that have been done to the Indigenous people by our white patriarchal capitalist system. Um, for example, the high incarceration rates of Aboriginal people, the forced removal of Indigenous children from their families, and the ongoing and devastating results or um, educational and health results that they experience. Um, as a socialist, I understand that these issues have to be addressed immediately, but I also understand that racism will not be eradicated until we have nailed the coffin on capitalism and laid it to rest forever. So um, just a little bit about this forum. All around the world, we are seeing an alarming rise in support for far-right ideas from the popularity of Trump in the US to the Modi government in India. Most importantly, there is a large growth of support for far-right parties in Europe, with the far-right gaining majority in the European Parliament. Tonight, we've got two speakers. We originally had three, but... Uh, the speaker from the Communist Party of India, Marxist Leninist Liberation, unfortunately can't make it. They do hope to participate in future forums. So our two speakers are Zain Elkum, who's a member of um, Social Science, and John Mullen, who is online. He's a Marxist act, uh, activist based in Paris and a Green Left contributor. So I would like to, Zain, are you going first? John. John's going first, right. Okay, so John, would you like to start? Uh, yeah, so for, first of all, thank you very much for uh, for inviting me. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, listening to people's opinions and uh, and uh, stuff about other parts of the world. Uh, my name is John Mullen. I've been uh, uh, living in the Paris region for the last 35 years. I've been active in uh, for um, anti-capitalist politics for the last 35 years here. Um, now, uh, as you all know, uh, the struggle against uh, fascism is, is a matter of life and death for the working class. The fascist project is to help capitalism deal with its crisis by making trade unions impossible, making working class unity impossible, and by <coughs> spreading hatred and violence in our lives with no foreseeable end to it except more hatred and more violence. So how do you push back fascism? when it's a small movement trying to build it up, build itself up? How do you fight fascism when the fascist party has 140 odd members of parliament like they do in France today? 50 more than last year, I will come to that. Um, how do you fight fascism when one of its leaders is prime minister like in Italy today? Well, I'm going to talk mostly about France. I'll give a little bit of, uh, of, uh, of context for, from Europe because it's where I live and because the situation is very unstable and I think uh, gives a number of uh, uh, lessons, both positive and negative. I, I think the two main lessons I would say from the crisis in France these last few months and going forward is firstly that the rise and fall of fascist forces is very closely linked at every stage to class struggle. It's not a bunch of evil people who appear on the on the stage of history who we have to fight. It's very closely linked to class struggle. And I hope to show that. Uh, and secondly, I think it, the situation in France has really shown the importance of looking at the concrete situation in each country, the strengths and interests and strategies of the different players and the opportunities to be grasped. Uh, we cannot be satisfied with generalities. Uh, in particular, I'll be talking about ele uh, uh, elections and uh, how important elections are or are not. Uh, we cannot be satisfied with generalities. We cannot be satisfied with quotes from Trotsky. 
Uh, across Europe, there has been a rise in the far right over the last four, uh, 30 years. This has accompanied the wave after wave of neoliberal attacks on living conditions, on the welfare state, on trade unions, on working class unity. And the far right has managed to convince millions of people, including important sections, especially of the unorganized working class, that the real enemy is the immigrant, the Muslim, trans people, especially trans athletes, leftist teachers, people who like progressive comedians and so on. And this far right proposes a reorganization of society around an imagined exclusive national community. At the top of the leaflets distributed in my town last month by the neo-fascist National Rally, the party of uh, Marine Le Pen and Jordan Bordella, uh, was written, we will defend your identity and your borders. Now, at the same time as this rise of the far right, other millions have become convinced that the enemy is the 1%, the billionaires. We're in a situation of polarization. So in France, it's true that at their best, at the highest vote, uh, the, the uh, neo-fascists got 13 million. At the same time, uh, the radical left, uh, France Insoumise, uh, France in Revolt, that I, I, I'm an activist with, uh, got 8 million on a very uh, radical uh, programme. Uh, so that there, is, uh, there is a rise of the far right, but it's also in the context of a polarisation. The big losers are the traditional parties of right and left who have uh, been uh, carrying out these uh, horrific attacks on working class people when they're in government. Just to give you an example, the Socialist Party in France got down after having been uh, the in the presidency and in the government a few years before, got down to 2% votes in one of the presidential elections a few, year, a few years ago. So how far has the rise of the far right gone? Well, in the European elections, uh, just uh, so six weeks ago, uh, the far right came first in six countries, France, Italy, Hungary, Austria, Belgium and Slovenia, and second in six more, Germany, Poland, the Netherlands, Romania, the Czech Republic and, Sl and, and Slovakia. The Italian far right under Prime Minister Meloni got nearly 29% and the German um, AFD got 16%. But I'm going to look in specific, uh, specifically about France, because that way we can look at how uh, the fight back is being organised, what has worked, what has not worked. Uh, and I'm hoping that there are some lessons for, for people in, in other countries. Why is fascism so strong in France? So strong in France when over the last 30 years, we've seen a whole series of mass working class struggles, which have made it clear that uh, political class consciousness is a very widespread uh, thing in the working class in France. Millions of people who were not personally affected by the changes in pensions were on the streets. Millions of people a few years before who were not personally affected by a law which would make contract work contract condition for young people under 25 much, much worse, were on the streets, were on, were, were on strike. There is a political class consciousness, which is one of the reasons it's been possible to build a new radical left. Uh, and so uh, this is this is uh, this is one of one of the big reasons is it's a reaction of the establishment uh, to uh, this waves, uh, these waves of class struggle in the face of a rebellious working class, the rise of the far right was extremely useful to the neoliberal establishment. Now, seven years ago, President Macron, uh, when he was uh, trying at first to be president, declared he wanted to be Francis Thatcher. Now, the very fact that he should say this uh, uh, seven years ago shows how successful, how relatively successful the French working class has been in pushing off the uh, the worst of neoliberalism, because we're, uh, Thatcher, of course, was the 1980s. And in 2010, uh, in, in France, Macron saying he'd like to be uh, uh, Fra uh, Francis Thatcher. Uh, that is to say he wanted decisive victories for capital which would demoralise workers' resistance for de decades. This did not work out well for him. Mass revolt was the res result. Millions of workers organised strikes and protests in 2019 and again in 2023, supported by 80% of the entire population, uh, including uh, people who are not workers, uh, uh, against the raising of the retirement age. Last year, we saw masses of farmers on the streets with their tractors revolting against poverty and explo exploitation. In 2018, 2019, inspiring yellow vest movements in areas revolting against poverty and the neglect of public services in rural France. Last summer, protests and riots against racist murders by the police 
a big movement uh, uh, these last few years against sexist violence and the movement for Palestine, which has not been as big as it what was, for example, in Britain, but that was a very significant movement. And just a last example, just last week, ecological organisations organising direct action against huge irrigation projects which reserve more and more water solely for the big industrial farms. Faced with these very regular big revolts, Macron responded by increasing authoritarianism, more sidelining of parliaments, violent repression and more powers for the police. The Yellow Vest movement in particular saw dozens of demonstrators losing an eye or a hand because of illegal police use of tear grass grenades. And Ma Macron's second response was encouraging the far right by stealing its policies. Uh, and uh, the radical left have been saying for some years that the relationship between Macron and Marine Le Pen is more of a duet than a duel. So what did Macron do to steal the policy of the far right? Islamophobic laws banning Muslim legal defense organizations. Uh, Muslim preachers were deported on Trump top charges. Meanwhile, uh, Macron's ministers claimed that French universities had been taken over by Islamo leftists, if only. <laughs> Uh, and, he, uh, and as for the schools, his ministers said they were controlled by woke ideology and needed a good do do dose of di discipline, a return to school uniform, authority and old fashioned values. One of the favourite targets were Muslims. And this is for a particular reason in France, uh, over and above uh, the reasons uh, for Islamopho state Islamophobia in other countries. And that is that Macron knew that the response by the left would be very much muted since Islamophobia on the left in France is not at all rare for reasons we can go into later if people wish. Uh, the uh, determination of the left to, um, to fight Islamophobia has been multiplied by 10 in the last 10 years. That is to say, it's still very weak. It, it used to be absolutely pathetic. Uh, and now it's like a quarter of left people think you should uh, fight Islamophobia. Just last month, President Macron went even further during the election campaign in uh, in um, what's the word in uh, encouraging uh, far right ideas. Uh, he described the left alliance program as completely immigrationist, using a word which was actually invented by the fascists. And he also mocked the changes in the law that the left are asking for to make transition easier for trans people by saying it's a crazy idea. You'd just be able to go down to the town hall and change your sex. So Macron built up uh, the far right uh, at the same time as presenting himself as the only uh, possible alternative to the far right. The mainstream media also gave solid support to the normalization of the neo-fascists. Uh, Marine Le Pen and her organization have been tremendously successful in convincing millions of people that they have left their fascist past behind them. And this is completely, uh, completely untrue, uh, but they're, they're certainly hiding it very well. Recent polls showed that we are now only 41 percent of the population uh, who think that the national rally uh, uh, is a threat to de to democracy. I, I, I'm of course, Polls are the most, not the most important element in the fight against fascism. 41% of the, of, of the population is plenty to smash the, the fascists into the dust. But nevertheless, obviously, it's bad news. To go back to the rise of the national rally, uh, uh, pretending to have left its fascist past behind, uh, past behind it, some sections of the bosses gave money to the national rally. But mostly, the bosses' attitude has been that they are delighted to have the far right dividing the working classes and putting politics to the right and making people hate Muslims instead of austerity. But the bosses prefer in their vast majority not to have, for the moment, national rally uh, in government. Uh, they're happy to have the media inviting fascists to every talk show to talk about their favourite recipes. Uh, the fascist MPs are at every uh, garage sale in town, uh, kissing babies and shaking hands. All that uh, that that uh, that pleases the capitalists, but they don't want the government for the moment. How do we know this? Well, if you look at the financing of the National Rally, you can see that no bank in France would agree to lend them the 40 million euros they needed for the election campaign. This is certainly because they would be uh, frightened of a political campaign against the bank. Uh, that is to say, uh, they needed, say, 65 million Australian dollars and they couldn't uh, get, find a French bank to lend it to them. The most recent loan that they got, the National Rally, <coughs> came from 2,000 individuals loaning an average of 10,000 euros each. So this is small business people or richer people hedging their bets in case their hero, Macron, 
go, go, goes down. And the final important factor in the rise of the national rally is has been the weaknesses of left strategy against fascism in France. Now, I do want to be careful not to be giving marks out of 10 to uh, comrades who've been doing a lot more than me uh, against the fascists. Nevertheless, it's important to uh, have a critical eye on what's been done. All too often, forces on the left have considered either that traditional conservative parties or Macron's radical centre were all fascists, really, and so did not see the need for a specific united front against the national rally involving mass education and harassment. Or, perhaps even more common, forces on the left considered that the, ascent, the essential step of building the radical left alternative to attack the poverty and injustice which the fascists thrive on was the only step necessary. That is to, to say that it, it is true that we need to build a radical left alternative, but that is not sufficient uh, to fight the fascists. We also need specific campaigns against the party structures and party and fascist infiltration of uh, everyday life and institutions. So the uh, anti-fascist initiatives, uh, there were scattered uh, local anti-fascist initiatives, which could be very healthy, but the more common responses on the left were either small groups wanted to pick a fight with the small fascist street gangs without worrying about what the masses were doing, or initiatives which really involved, even if they didn't admit it, considering that you couldn't be a real anti-fascist unless you were an anti-capitalist revolutionary. I'll give us a couple of examples. So for many years, in the 90s in particular, an organisation called Halofront, fed up with the National Front, was one of the main faces of anti-fascism. It built up to 200 local groups, organised hundreds of local demonstrations. It built its organisation around public sales of its rather long newspaper, which detailed the life of the far right. One month, several pages on radical right royalist groups. The next month, several pages on the danger to women of, uh, of a return to traditional, traditional morality or on the far right in the USA or interviews with undocumented mi migrants. It's not that the content was bad, but it never managed to attract far outside activist circles. And although it said it was open to anybody, in fact, if you weren't from the far left, you wouldn't feel at home. If you were a socialist party person who hated the fascists, you wouldn't go to two meetings because uh, there'd be so much uh, negative attitudes to, uh, to the reformist left. Probably the most successful example from the last uh, 30 years is the campaign Manifesto Against the National Front, which existed for uh, 10 years or so from 1990. This was a national mass single issue campaign of education and harassment in March 1997. 50,000 demonstrated in Strasbourg against the National Front Conference. Buses came from all over France, some from Germany. Leading left po politicians were present, but also singers and other personalities. And the counter demonstrations in many other towns as well seemed to put the front under pressure and divisions broke out in the National Front between the respectabilists and those in favour of a more open showing of traditional far-right priorities. The Front National, the National Front it was at the time, became the National Rally later, split into two organisations and took many years to recover, especially at a local level. Indeed, even today, uh, although the uh, National Rally has 143 members of Parliament, approximately, in most towns they have no party structure at all. Uh, so that's that's something very interesting to take it to take in, into account. So to return today, what happened? Macron called legislative elections after the uh, success of the far right of the European elections. He had a plan. He thought if we do th these elections very, very quickly, the left will not manage to unite. And so because of the two round electoral system, his own movement would be able to pose as the only alternative to the far right. However, it didn't work. The left, uh, the left uh, managed to unite the four parties, the Greens, the Socialists, the Communists and France in Revolt, of which I'm a part, uh, managed to join to write a, a radical left program, which would which would uh, give people enthusiasm uh, and uh, and to push the fascists back into third place in the second round of the parliamentary elections. Uh, this program uh, has been described in all the newspapers as, as, as radical and firebrand, but I'd just like to, to, uh, to give, uh, give, give a few details. Uh, there are 150 reforms, I'm not going to list them all, but raising the minimum wage by 15% and all public employees' wages by 10%. 
cancelling the two-year rise in the standard retirement age, cancelling recent cuts in unemployment be benefit, re-establishing a wealth tax, building a million homes, defending tenants' rights, abrogating the recent racist immigration, immigration laws, giving legal papers to all undocumented migrant workers, stopping selling arms to Israel, investing heavily in opposing domestic violence, freezing the water irrigation infrastructure plans, which are taking water from small farms to reserve it for agri agribusiness, guaranteeing minimum prices for farmers, pro farmers produce to reduce profiteering by supermarket chains and fighting uh, Islam Islamophobia. And that is to say that this was a program <coughs> which puts into an electoral program many, many demands of mass movements over the last 10 years. So what is the re what is the result? What is the situation today? Well, in the parliament today, the three main blocks, the left, Macron supporters and the neo-fascists are all a long way from having a majority. Uh, we have, a, I think we have around 150, 180 for the left, there's around 160 for Macron and his bunch, and around 143 uh, for the, the 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 far right and the close close allies. We are going to have a very deep and very long uh, uh, political crisis. How do I know this? Well, the French constitution forbids repeat elections for at least 12 months. They will not be new elections. So whatever happens, uh, the, 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 whatever government is formed, it will be under, hu under huge pressure uh, from the other side. Now, normally, uh, Macron ought to have named a prime minister from the left bloc as the biggest group in parliament. That's what he's always done in the past. That's what every president always, always done in the past. Macron is refusing to do that. Uh, fortunately, the uh, the left bloc, uh, after difficult negotiations for good reasons, uh, came up with a, with a name and and have pr pr proposed Lucy Casti uh, as the as the as, as the next next prime minister. Who the main thing to know about her is that she said an alliance with Macron's bloc is impossible, and uh, that uh, uh, she she that the the uh, um, she's in a hurry to reverse the retirement um, the retirement age changes that took place took place uh, uh, last year so what's going to happen next well either uh, we're going to have a minority left government uh, which will require a mass mobilization sometimes to support it when it tries to do things that, that that are being blocked which but which are in our program and also to give it a good um, uh, kick up the backside uh, if it's breaking or compromising uh, ex uh, 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 ex excessively the key thing about <coughs> the elections which just happened is that the way that um, the fascists were pushed back into third place is that this was the most dynamic election campaign I've seen in 40 years. A hundred thousand people at least suddenly got involved uh, in giving out leaflets at railway stations, doing mass door-to-door -door work, which is not a tradition in France. Uh, and that is, uh, uh, that is what pushed the fascists back. And that is also... Uh, uh, something which we have to very much hope that these people who got involved will stay involved or stay mobilized to continue pushing the fasc fascists back uh, with a bit of luck helping to convince the left for the need for a mass national uh, specific campaign of education har and harassment uh, ag uh, 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 against uh, against national rally. And I'm sorry, I forgot the beginning of my sentence. I'm not quite quite sure left. Just finally, then, because I'm coming to the end of the of the, of the time I have, uh, a couple of uh, uh, of uh, lessons for anti capitalists. First of all, about avoiding generalities. Of course, in general, we think that elections are not the most important thing in political life and that strikes and mass mobilizations are, are more important. However, we just had a situation where we were going to have a fascist government and we don't because of elections. Uh, and 100,000 people got involved or more because it was an election campaign. They believed in the program. They hated the, hated, hated the fascists. So this month, those left organizations who have been saying, don't forget that elections are not very important, are just being silly. Uh, this month, the elections were the most important. Most months, elections are not the most important thing for uh, anti-capitalist activists, but they were this time. Uh, and secondly, I would say um, that we need to, uh, in France, we need to push 
to, uh, towards a generalization of some of the best local initiatives against the fascists. The fascists know that they have a very weak party structure uh, around the country uh, and we have to make sure uh, they're determined to build it up and we have to make sure they don't. Uh, so there's a uh, uh, lot of things to worry about, uh, a lot of dangers. There's always a lot of dangers when you do anything in politics, but also uh, a lot of hope. And, and uh, uh, I'm hoping that we, we will see uh, exciting mass mobilizations in the autumn. I'm expecting that to happen. Thank you. Thank you, John. <laughs> right, um, we'll, we'll go straight on to our second speaker, Zane, when you're ready. Uh, all right, cheers comrades. Um, my name is Zane. I've <clears throat> been a Socialist Alliance member for about 20 years, which is concerning. Um, <laughs> Um, I originally got involved during the invasion of uh, Iraq, which I found highly offensive and still do. Um, bit of my background, my, my grandmother, my Omar, was, um, she was a small child in the Netherlands when the Netherlands was invaded by the Nazis. And her earliest memory was of her mother crying as Nazi paratroopers came into the Netherlands. And uh, she... She was very hungry during the occupation and nearly starved. So I feel like I might not be here because of Nazis and I have a visceral hatred for them. So, um, yeah, that's just a bit of my background and intergenerational trauma. Um, well, I've just uh, thrown something together because I've been proletarian and I've been selling my labor and so on. Um, okay, so I guess... Um, to talk about the rise of the far right around the world. Um, I'm wanting to look at, I guess, the dynamics of the capitalist system and the way that capitalism creates the oxygen or the building blocks by which the far right um, uh, feed on or the oxygen they breathe, that the, the nourishment that they require to um, grow and uh, thrive. So I guess capitalism uses everyday methods of distraction and diversion like racism, sexism, uh, homophobia, transphobia, uh, nationalism, anti-woke uh, or anti-greeny sentiment. And these are useful to the ruling class because they distract from the class struggle, the fight for a better, fairer, more democratic world. Um, so these, these sort of struggles uh, for progressive change um, they undercut the profit motive. So if you're forcing the government to build public housing, that's expensive. If you're forcing your workplace to be more safe, that's expensive for your workplace. Um, if you are wanting to make sure that there are women's shelters so that women are able to safely flee violence, that's expensive because the state has to pay for it. So um, on the one hand, capitalism doesn't like progressive change because it's costs money to have a fair and pleasant and safe world. Uh, but on the other hand, the struggles to win those sort of reforms can also gain legs and gain momentum and turn into something more radical and potentially even revolutionary. Uh, so uh, using everyday racism, sexism, homophobia, Islamophobia, um, it's it's useful on, on sort of both those fronts. And it's also useful as a tool of like uh, taking up our energy as progressives in society because look at right now um, the, the left is putting heaps of energy into stopping a genocide in Gaza as we fucking should right it's it's horrendous what's happening over there but because we're putting all that energy into that it's harder to get on the front foot on various other issues that the climate crisis the housing crisis because the left is kind of small we, our energy is limited, and so we kind of have to focus on the most urgent um, thing sometimes. And in, at the moment, it's, um, you know, solidarity with, with Gaza. Um, going back a few years from the period 2016 to 2018, the far right was emboldened in Australia. So you had Reclaim Australia, um, and then, there, you know, the various bloody evolutions and offshoots of the far right and the fascists. And a lot of lefties were taking up a lot of energy, pushing back against them, mobilizing against them in the streets. And again, that was energy that we were spending fighting reactionary scum instead of getting on the front foot, fighting for 
all sorts of uh, progressive causes. Um, I guess another aspect which is relevant to the rise of the far right is the way that racism and nationalism can also build support for wars of conquest and the two can be self-reinforcing. So, um, well, going back to the example of Gaza, um, you know, the there's been an ongoing sort of campaign to, or I guess, brainwash the Israeli population to support the occupation of um, Palestine. And that sort of has its own uh, momentum. And then as that builds and as the, as the body politic in Israel moves further to the right, um, this has enabled ever more um, horrific attacks on the people of, of Palestine. And then um, people almost um, justify what is happening by going further down the far right rabbit hole, because the alternative to that would be to say, oh, um, we've been led to um, support something very terrible um, and our government is fucked. And that's a very difficult realisation for some people to come to. And so they're kind of um, being determined consciousness. And so if people are immersed in a project that is, um, you know, engaging in an imperialist bloodshed, um, they will sometimes rationalise that to themselves by getting behind far-right and racist ideas because the alternative uh, is to to be like, oh, I'm a, I'm a small <laughs> cog in a big, scary machine that I don't have much power to confront. Um, fascism. Um, so fascism is a bit different to everyday racism, nationalism, sexism that the, that the capitalism uses to kind of distract from and, and sort of defend itself. Fascism is different. That's where the far right is given power by the ruling class to violently crush working class struggle. Um, however, having a fascist police state is uh, even more expensive than having lots of public housing and women's shelters and climate action and all the sort of progressive stuff that we want to see implemented. Fascist, and, and paying all of those police to go around and monitor and control and suppress everyone is very expensive. So um, fascism is sort of a defense mechanism of last resort for the capitalist machine rather than the default mode for capitalism. And I just think it's important to remember that because sometimes people look at the everyday racism of center right and center left parties and be like, ah, oh, after the next election, it's going to be fascism and it's not that's not really the case um someone like trump does change the thinking there a little bit because the degeneration of mainstream politics in the usa has become so severe that in that case i would say um yeah there is a mainstream look <laughs> the republican party has degenerated so far that it's kind of like becoming pretty fascist and, and i think um the, the BJP in India would be another example of that. It's a mainstream centre-right party, but it's like, it's pretty much fascist. But in Australia, you wouldn't, you wouldn't really say that the Liberal Party, who are fucking racist scum, are quite the same as, you know, the NSN fascists who had a rally at the um, front of the state parliament the other day. They are different. Um, so the, the everyday tools of division the ruling class uses to divide the workers and distract from class struggle have the added benefit to the ruling class of keeping the building blocks of fascism at hand. So if there is a big um, people power uprising, it gets momentum, it takes on a revolutionary or radical trajectory and capitalism feels threatened by constantly cultivating the far right uh, the building blocks are there for capitalism to then um, move, to bring out the fascist hammer and start smashing people. Um, whereas if, um, I guess if you're in a, 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 something like, um, I don't know, like a, 
An example I might give is like, a, I don't know, Swedish social democracy, although these days they're very fucking racist and, and um, you know, Islamophobic as well. But look, I guess in that middle sort of period between the end of World War II and when things started going very pear-shaped, I guess within a stable social democracy, it's it's a lot harder to just whip up a bunch of fascists to destroy the workers' movement. Whereas um, over the last 30 or 40 years around the world, I think with the degeneration and dismantling of the welfare state, selling off of public assets, smashing of the unions, um, the growth of inequality, um, this has meant that it's kind of a important for capitalism to be able to mobilize more nasty far-right forces because the risk of uprising against capitalism is greater as capitalism dials up the level of inequality um and i think also because people are desperate and um you know don't have a roof over their head and find it hard to um, survive they're looking for answers why is why is the world so difficult why is life so difficult and under those conditions, it's a lot easier for the far right to say, oh, it's because of, of the, the woke people or it's because of the Muslims or it's because of the immigrants taking all your jobs. Um, so the antidote to the far right is to have a strong left that is taking the um, initiative and pushing the discussion away from racism, and sexism and pushing the focus back onto class struggle. So, of course, in the modern context, union struggle, mobilizing to fight back against gendered violence, fighting for First Nations rights, refugee rights, climate action, public housing, international solidarity. And if we can get momentum and win reforms around those things and build an even stronger left and even get towards uh, having, um, yeah, a, a socialist revolution, that momentum makes it a lot harder for... Um, the, the far right to recruit because they're sort of, um, we've got the kind of momentum on our side. Uh, this requires large, vibrant, diverse left political movement, socialist or in, in the past communist parties in, in some other countries around the world, communist parties really important part of the left, um, single issue organizations, um, strong union movement. Um, so I guess the rise of the far right I would see as part of capitalism painting itself into a corner during that period from post-World War II to now. Um, you had a, a kind of decent welfare state, reasonably not perfect, but a more equal distribution of wealth in that period from like the end of World War II until the probably mid 70s. And then the age of neoliberalism began and capitalism decided to start stripping away all of that modality of stability and ramping up the uh, inequality, taking away from the working class the things that it had given for a couple of decades uh, in, the, in the aftermath of World War II. Um, and so this has, um, this has weakened the working class because, as, as I was saying before, it's easier to fight when you've got food in your belly and a roof over your head. Um, but um, there is also the risk of um, big outbreaks of progressive protest. So whilst the left in general, in terms of um, as measured by the metric of large left-wing parties, as measured by the metric of membership of trade unions, the left is much weaker today um, than it was 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, but we have seen and we continue to see from time to time there are huge outbreaks of progressive protests and so um the yeah i think the ruling class responds uh with more racism sexism nationalism every time there is an outbreak of protest so like black lives matter or the climate strike um movement and so I think the trend over time has been as um, as the Keynesian sort of welfare state has been dismantled and we've moved to neoliberalism and a much more unequal society, um, capitalism has had to ramp up also the level of 
everyday racism, sexism, nationalism, and that is the oxygen that the far right feeds off. And then we've seen the emergence here and elsewhere of far right parties. Like, so I, I, apart from a couple of small outbreaks, I think um, the the far right was quite marginal in. Um, well, I, I can speak mainly of Anglosphere countries. I'm I'm not an expert on uh, all of world politics, but like in Australia, for example, something like One Nation. You just wouldn't, I don't think a, a party like One Nation, whose main thing is we're going to stop the immigrants coming in here, would have existed from, I don't know, like, like when One Nation came about in the mid 90s, I think a lot of people were really shocked because this was a really ugly form of racist political party that people had not seen for, for decades. There'd been the white Australia policy and this kind of mainstream racism of the main parties. But to have a little party whose explicit platform was get rid of the migrants, um, that was something new. And that, I think, is really the hallmark of of the um, of where we find ourselves is the, uh, yeah, the, the dismantling of the welfare state, increasing inequality, the ruling class using more and more... Um, everyday um, racism, sexism, nationalism, Islamophobia, and that oxygen, those building blocks, the far right feed off that. And so now we're seeing the bubbling away, the emergence of, of far right parties, and then the next evolution of that, that we're particularly seeing in Europe more so than, than here at the moment is um, openly far right parties winning huge numbers of seats in, in parliament. Um, so I guess I'll wrap it up with a final point, which is that France um, shows there is reason for hope. Um, in recent years, we haven't only seen large outbreaks of popular protest around the world, but we've also seen the rapid building of large left-wing parties um, or, or large left-wing currents, even sort of within or around existing parties. So like Corbyn, the Sanders Green New Deal, um, sort of a lecturer campaign, Podemos in Spain, Syriza in Greece, and now the United Left Party in France, that should give us reason for hope. Um, for many years, I think the left was like really struggling to uh, break out of obscurity on the fringes. And what we've seen, I think, in the last 10 or 15 years is the very rapid building of very large left-wing um, forces, but they've sometimes kind of fallen over or they've gone back into a neoliberal track. There is promise for these um, left-wing parties that have been built up quite rapidly, like the United Left Party in France, to learn from the mistakes or, of, um, of their peers, like Syriza and Podemos, and not make the same mistakes as them and consolidate themselves into something quite powerful. Um, and, yeah, it, it, we can't just have a big left party. We've got to have people power in the streets and we've got to have high union density. So there's a few balls to juggle. So there is hope for um, to rebuild a big fighting left and take the oxygen and take those building blocks away from the far right. Um, but, yeah, it's... Uh, it's concerning times we live in.